So hello friends, I hope you are fine. In this video, we are going to read the chapter 16 of the book written by G. C. Leo. The title of the chapter is The Tropical Monsoon and Tropical Marine Climates. So let us start. Distribution We have learnt in chapter 13 that some parts of the world experience seasonal winds like land and sea breezes but on a much larger scale. These are the tropical monsoon lands with onshore wet monsoons in the summer and offshore dry monsoons in the winter. They are best developed in the Indian subcontinent, Burma, Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, parts of Vietnam and South China and Northern Australia. Outside this zone, the climate is modified by the influence of the onshore trade winds all the year round and has a more evenly distributed rainfall. Such a climate, better termed the tropical marine climate, is experienced in Central America, West Indies, Northeastern Australia, the Philippines, parts of East Africa, Madagascar, the Guinea coast and Eastern Brazil. Now, climatic conditions in tropical monsoon lands. The basic cause of monsoon climates is the difference in the rate of heating and cooling of land and sea. In the summer, when the sea is overhead, at the Tropic of Cancer, the great land masses of the Northern Hemisphere are heated. Central Asia, backed by the lofty Himalayan ranges, is more than 15 degrees Fahrenheit, hotter than its normal temperature, and a region of intense low pressure is set up. The seas, which warm up much slower, remain comparatively cool. At the same time, the southern hemisphere experiences winter, and a region of high pressure is set up in the continental interior of Australia. Winds blow outwards as the southeast monsoon to Java, and after crossing the equator, are drawn towards the subcontinental low pressure area, reaching the Indian subcontinent as the southwest monsoon, as shown in the figure. In the winter, conditions are reversed. The sun is overhead at the Tropic of Capricorn. Central Asia is extremely cold, resulting in rapid cooling of the land. A region of high pressure is created with outblowing winds. The northeast monsoon on crossing the equator. The winds are attracted to the low pressure center in Australia and arrive in northern Australia as the northeast monsoon. You can see here the figure. Now, the seasons of tropical monsoon climate. In regions like the Indian subcontinent, which have a true tropical monsoon climate, three distinct seasons are distinguishable as illustrated in the figure. The first one is the cool dry season, October to February. Temperatures are low 76 degrees Fahrenheit in Bombay and only 50 degrees Fahrenheit in Punjab with heavy sinking air. Frost may occur at night in the colder north. The center of high pressure is over the Punjab. Outblowing dry winds, the northeast monsoon bring little or no rain to the Indian subcontinent. However, a small amount of rain falls in Punjab from cyclonic sources and this is vital for the survival of winter cereals. Where the northeast monsoon blows over the Bay of Bengal, it acquires moisture and thus brings rain to the southeastern tip of the peninsula at this time of the year. For instance, in Madras, 50 inches of rain falls during October and November, accounting for half its annual rainfall. The second one is the hot dry season, that is March to mid-June. As can be seen from the figure, the temperature rises sharply with the sun's northward shift to the Tropic of Cancer. Bombay has a mean May temperature of 86 degrees Fahrenheit, which is considered moderate for many parts of India are even hotter. The heat is so great that schools and colleges are closed. The stifling heat and the low relative humidity make outdoor life almost unbearable. Day temperatures of 95 degrees Fahrenheit are usual in central India and the mean temperature in Sindh may be as high as 110 degrees Fahrenheit. Coastal districts are a little relieved by sea bridges. There is practically no rain anywhere. By May, the temperature is so high that an intense low pressure zone is set up in northwest India. Dust storms are frequent, followed by long awaited rainstorms that break by the middle of June. The transitional period between no rain and plenty of rain is over. The third one is the rainy season, that is, mid June to September. With the burst of the southwest monsoon in mid-June, torrential downpours sweep across the country to the delight of everybody. Almost all the rain for the year falls within this rainy season. For example, in Bombay, 19.9 inches are recorded in June, 24 inches in July, 14.5 inches in August and a further 10.6 inches in September. As much as 95% of the annual rainfall is concentrated within four months. This pattern of concentrated heavy rainfall 
in summer is a characteristic feature of the tropical monsoon climate. The torrential downpours have an immediate impact on the local temperature. They lower the temperature considerably. The mean temperature for Bombay is 86 degree Fahrenheit in May but only 81 degree Fahrenheit in July. In the north, the drop is even greater as much as 13 degree Fahrenheit. Some of the windward stations on the Himalayan foothills have very heavy rainfall. Though this is partly orographic, Chirapunji has an average annual rainfall of 4 to 5 inches and a record of 905 inches in 1861. Now we are going to read the retreating monsoons. The amount and frequency of rain decreases towards the end of the rainy season. It retreats gradually southwards after mid-September until it leaves the continent altogether. The Punjab plains which receive the southwest monsoon earliest are the first to see the withdrawal of the monsoon. The skies are clear again and the cool dry season returns in October with the outblowing northeast monsoon. The role of monsoons in India is vital in its economy. A late monsoon or one that ends far too early will condemn large stretches of agricultural land to drought. There will be widespread famine from crop failure and thousands will perish. When there is too much water from the rainy monsoons, severe floods occur, destroying both crops and lives and disrupting communications. In no part of the world has the climate affected man's way of life so profoundly as in the monsoon lands. Now we are going to read the tropical marine climate. This type of climate is experienced along the eastern coasts of tropical lands, receiving steady rainfall from the trade winds all the time. The rainfall is both orographic where the moist trades meet upland masses as in eastern Brazil and convectional due to intense heating during the day and in summer. Its tendency is towards a summer maximum as in monsoon lands but without any distinct dry period. Figure 126b shows the rhythm of climate as experienced in Cairns on the eastern coast of Queensland under the constant influence of the southeast trade winds and in summer also affected by the tropical monsoons. Its wettest months are in January, that is 15.8 inches, February 16.4, March 17.7, and April. 12.1, which is summer in the southern hemisphere, approximately 70% of the annual rainfall is concentrated in the four summer months. There is no month without any rainfall. The range of temperature is typical of the tropical latitudes with a maximum of 82 degree Fahrenheit in January and a minimum of 70 degree Fahrenheit in July, a range of 12 degree Fahrenheit for the year. Due to the steady influence of the trades, the tropical marine climate is more favorable for habitation, but it is prone to severe tropical cyclones, hurricanes or typhoons as mentioned in chapter 13. Now, tropical monsoon forests. The natural vegetation of tropical monsoon lands depends on the amount of the summer rainfall. Trees are normally deciduous because of the marked dry period during which they shed their leaves to withstand the drought, where the rainfall is heavy, example in southern Burma, peninsular India, northern Australia and coastal regions with a tropical marine climate, the resultant vegetation is forest. The forests are more open and less luxuriant than the equatorial jungle and there are far fewer species. Most of the forests yield valuable timber and are prized for their durable hardwood. Amongst these, teak is the best known. Burma alone accounts for as much as three quarters of the world's production. It is such a durable timber that it is extensively used for shipbuilding, furniture and other constructional purposes. Other kinds of timber include sal, acacia and some varieties of eucalyptus in northern Australia. Together with the forest are bamboo thickets which often grow to great heights. With a decrease in rainfall in summer, the forest thin out onto thorny scrubland or savanna. With scattered trees and tall grass. In parts of the Indian subcontinent, rainfall is so deficient that semi-desert conditions are found. Monsoonal vegetation is thus most varied, ranging from forests to thickets and from savanna to scrubland. Now, agricultural development in the monsoon lands. Much of the monsoon forest has been cleared for agriculture to support the very dense population. The cultural landscape throughout the length and breadth of the monsoon winds 
deeply reflects the intensity of man's quest for subsistence. Wherever possible, crops are grown, the plains are plucked, and the hills are terraced to provide farmland. Farms are small, and the people are forever land hungry. In their quest for land, they have removed the natural vegetation, sometimes wantonly, resulting in acute soil erosion. This is particularly serious in the Indian subcontinent, which has a very high density of population with a rapid rate of growth. But in the plains, the same piece of land may have been tilled for generations with little or no replenishment and yet able to yield fairly reasonable returns. Tropical agriculture dependent on natural rainfall and a large labor force reaches its greatest magnitude in the monsoon lands. The soil provides the basis for the livelihood of millions. Farming is not only the dominant occupation of the greater part of the people, but also forms the mainstay of the economy of the Indian subcontinent. China, Southeast Asia, Eastern Brazil and the West Indies. The following types of agriculture are recognizable. The first one is wet paddy cultivation. Rice is the most important staple crop and is grown in tropical lowlands wherever the rain exceeds 70 inches. It is perhaps the most characteristic crop of the monsoon lands and is total acreage far exceeds that of any other crop. In fact, very few areas outside the influence of the monsoons ever take to the cultivation of paddy. There are two main varieties. The wet paddy which is mainly grown on lowlands in flooded fields or in terraced uplands and the dry paddy grown in regions of lower rainfall. A minimum of 50 inches of rainfall is required during the growing season. Droughts and floods that are almost inseparable from a monsoonal type of climate can be very detrimental to its cultivation. Irrigation water from rivers, canals, dams or wells is extensively used in the major rice producing countries. Other food crops like maize, millet, sorghum, wheat, gram and beans are of subsidiary importance. They are cultivated in the drier or cooler areas where rice cannot be grown. The second one is lowland cash crops. A wide range of lowland tropical cash crops are cultivated for the export market after local needs have been met. The most important crop in the category is cane sugar. As much as two-thirds of the world's sugar production comes from tropical countries, sugar is either grown on plantations or on small holdings wherever rainfall and sunshine are abundant. Some of the major producers include India, Java, Formosa, Cuba, Jamaica, Trinidad and Barbados. Jute is confined almost entirely to the Ganges Brahmaputra Delta. In India and Bangladesh, it has long been a leading hard fiber for the manufacture of Saks Gani. Manila hemp abaca is a product of the Philippines, particularly for Mindano. It is used to make high quality rope. Other crops include indigo, still cultivated in India and Java, cotton, a major export of the Indian subcontinent, and bananas, coconuts, and spices. The third one is highland plantation crops. The colonization of tropical lands by Europeans gave rise to a new form of cultivated landscape in the cooler monsoonal highlands. This is the cultivation of certain tree crops in tropical plantations. Thousands of acres of tropical upland forest were cleared to make way for plantation agriculture in which tea and coffee are the most important crops. These were luxuries in Europe in the 18th century and the products of the plantations are, were originally meant only for export to the mother countries where there was a great craze for the beverages. Later, the local people also got into the habit of drinking them and the fast became necessities. Both the beverages became so popular in and out of the tropics that there was great expansion in their acreages both in regions with the tropical monsoon climate and the tropical marine climate. Coffee originated in Ethiopia and Arabia where it is still grown but Brazil now accounts for almost half the world's production of coffee. It is mainly grown on the eastern slopes of the Brazilian plateau. The crop is also cultivated on the highland slopes between 2000 feet and 4500 feet in the Central American states, India and Eastern Java. T originated in China and is still an important crop there but as it requires moderate temperatures about 60 degree Fahrenheit, heavy rainfall over 60 inches and well drained highland slopes it thrives well in the tropical monsoon zone but preferably at a higher altitude but the best regions are thus the Himalayan foothills of India and Bangladesh, the central highlands of Sri Lanka and western Java from all of which it is exported. In China tea is grown mostly for local consumption. The fourth one is Lumbering. 
wherever there are tropical forest which still have not been felled to make way for the plow lumbering is undertaken in the more accessible areas this is particularly important in continental southeast asia of the tropical deciduous trees teak of which burma is the leading producer is perhaps the most sought after it is valuable on account of its great durability strength immunity to shrinkage fungus attack and insects it is grown in hilly districts up to 3000 feet in altitude with a moderate rainfall under government supervision trees teak trees which are cut have to be replaced this is the only way to ensure the steady supply of the timber which is the second greatest money earner for burma after rice in northern burma in the region of the chindwin river there are large teak plantations it takes as long as 100 years for a teak tree to mature into commercial timber green teak logs are so heavy that they will not float readily in water it is therefore necessary to poison the tree several years before actually felling so that it is dry and light enough to be floated down on the chindwin and the irawadi to reach the sawmills at rangoon The individual logs are tied in rafts and guided downstream by crews of men and tugboats. It takes something like 18 months for a log of teak to reach Rangoon to be sawn into planks for export. The fifth one is shifting cultivation. This most primitive form of farming is widely practiced. Instead of rotating the crops in the same field to preserve fertility, the tribesmen move to a new clearing when their first field is exhausted. The clearing or field in the midst of the jungle is usually made by fire, which destroys practically everything in its way. After planting, little attention is paid to the field either in breeding or manuring. The crops are left entirely to the care of nature. The farmers use simple hoes and sticks for ploughing and seeding. Broad animals are unknown and labor is ex- exclusively manual their needs are so basic that every farmer produces much the same range of crops as his neighbors maize or corn dry paddy yams tapioca sweet potatoes and some beans are the most common crops farming is entirely for subsistence that is everything is consumed by the farmer's family it is not traded or sold as tropical soils are mainly latosolic rapidly leached and easily exhausted the first crop may be bountiful but the subsequent harvest deteriorate a few years later the field has to be abandoned and a new patch cleared elsewhere this system of a short period of cultivation alternating with long periods of fallowing is probably the best way of using land in many parts of the tropics where manuring is unknown Shifting cultivation is so widely practiced amongst indigenous peoples that different local names are used in different countries for example ladang in malaysia tongya in burma tamarai in thailand kangin in the philippines huma in java chena in sri lanka and milpa in africa and central america with this our chapter ends in the next video we will read the next chapter till then Stay healthy listen to the audiobooks and study well